Hello, welcome to Aspects of D&D. This is, I think, the third time I'm doing this. Uh, there are a couple of others. This is just a, a discussion video of, well, different aspects of D&D, different things that make up what Dungeons & Dragons is at a conceptual level, um, and I guess offering uh, a vision, my vision, of of how it can work and I think what the system is designed to be and today we're going to talk about a really important central feature of uh, of Dungeons and Dragons I think in in its early editions but XP but particularly in early editions terms gold for XP the idea that the gold you take out of the dungeon becomes experience points you score experience by getting gold uh, and this thing that stops being the case uh, completely from third edition and becomes only an optional rule from second edition so you think man it really it really is actually initially only uh, OD&D original D&D basic D&D and advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition which have this core rule and it's a controversial rule it's um, one reason it's abandoned is uh, because it's uh, seen as stupid and unrealistic and encouraging the wrong behavior and lots of things like this and essentially the this is in both at a theoretical level and in my experience very wrong I think it's actually a very uh, asinine analysis of uh, gold for XP XP is uh, and in, it is right to say maybe it, it incentivizes behavior but that's what we should think about what I'll talk about today particularly is uh, what gold for XP incentivizes in terms of player behavior and what it allows in terms of player behavior uh, we start actually just uh, in the most obvious place, the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. And here we have Gary giving the rule under experience about how you work out the experience value of treasure taken. Convert all metal and gems and jewellery to a total value in gold pieces. If the relative value of the monsters or guardian device equals or exceeds that of the party which took the treasure experience is awarded at one to one, it can become less. Treasure must be physically taken out of the dungeon or lair and turned into a transportable medium or stored in the player's stronghold to be counted for experience points. All items, including magic items or creatures sold for gold pieces prior to the awarding of experience points for an adventure must be considered as treasure taken and the gold pieces received to the sale add to the total treasure taken. Uh, creatures there is particularly referring to here dragons to do with dragon subdual rules. Uh, you can take or leave that as you like. Uh, magic items become XP. In first edition, they become XP at, in one of two ways. Either as a, whatever you sell it for, you get the value of the magic item, you know, 10,000 gold or whatever it might be. Or if you keep a magic item, you get a lower, generally speaking, about 20% of that XP as XP. You've got the magic item, it's a very valuable item. Uh, if you sell it, you get the full value. If not, you don't. Um, the rest of it only needs to be turned into a transportable medium or stored. So other gold doesn't need to be uh, exchanged for anything. It can just be kept and it becomes XP at a certain rate. Uh, one to one is the basic uh, level and I think it is that in, in, in basic as well. Um, as I think it's just one to one. Gary has a few things in AD&D which scale to uh, player accomplishment. So one is actually, for instance, training time is multiplied, negatively multiplied. It becomes longer based on uh, the poorer role playing of the character. Role playing here being doing the thing the class should do. Um, here, it's uh, based on difficulty. If a 10th level wizard attacks a bunch of kobolds, 10 kobolds guarding 1,000 GP, they will get about 5% of the, so the, the, as in they will uh, get 50 XP for that would be his idea. Uh, he says it's subjective, it depends on the situation. Uh, but there are even even within early D&D &D, there's different ways of doing it. Now why does he think you should do it here? This I'm going to spoil it and say this is not actually a very good explanation. Uh, we, Gary is a very good rules designer in the, uh, at this point in time, um, but the first edition DMG, the best D&D &D book ever, nonetheless has plenty of areas where you've got to mull and consider and uh, uh, really get into the arcana of why something's been designed a certain way because the rules are very carefully designed even if they're not always perfectly explained. Here he says players who balk at uh, escort, uh, equating gold pieces to experience points are firmly reminded this is a compromise. It's more realistic for clerics etc. Thieves to do this. They're all practicing their jobs 
all very realistic but conducive to non-game boredom. So Gary responds to a specific criticism that is not realistic, but he says, well, the thing you would need to do is to spend your time in the game practicing. And so you wouldn't, you know, you'd train in the sense you'd practice, not in the sense that you would um, uh, roll a training roll. Uh, and that would be the whole game, and that would be very boring. And I, I'm thinking about, though I don't know the game very well, it's very, uh, I'm learning it at the moment, when you hear about improvement in Traveller, the idea that you take up so much in-game time, uh, in-game calendar time, not in-game table time, with improvement, then it becomes a fairly null element of the game. There's a parallel that you think, well, players aren't going to want to do it if they've got to say, oh, I, I'll go and do this, I'll make a roll to do the practice, okay, I'll go and do this, I'll, you know. And it takes time away from doing other stuff they want to do. Um, now, that's actually not really the mechanical effect or purpose of gold for XP. He doesn't defend gold for XP, he simply says it's compromised. He refuses to explain why he's done it, instead deriding the seemingly implicitly proposed alternative. Now, here is what gold for XP accomplishes, uh, basically, is that it is a measure of player skill to remove things from the dungeon. It shows they've been there, it is their 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 stamp in their passport, um, it is their exam uh, certificate. That is what Gold for XP is. Um, the, it is something where you can go you go into the dungeon. Originally, originally we're talking about an entirely dungeon adventure uh, and you go to the lower the level, so remember it's that you have first level characters going to the first level of the dungeon, fighting first level, one HD monsters, and they're getting treasure and then once they level up ironically maybe it should be leveled down given these originally are chiefly going underground you go to level two and fight level two monsters and there's more xp because it has to become more difficult uh, and uh, each in the phb in the first edition phb and equivalent phbs each class has a different um a different xp table uh, which I don't know if I'll make a video about this at some point, but I should. But the idea that the classes are balanced against each other and races are balanced against each other mechanically uh, via things like XP and other effects is incredibly uh, clever. It's very good design. But that's the point of gold for XP, is that it is a measure of skill. Uh, because And it's partly based on the Appendix N inspirations. For Gary, you know, you've got your Conan and your... your Faffin and the Grey Mauser, particularly these uh, rogues who go around adventuring, fighting, sometimes fighting bad guys and monsters, uh, often stealing or finding or recovering treasure, and D and D is in part based on on that tradition. And so you, your players, your characters go into the dungeon, and you show that you're good at things, and therefore you earn leveling up by getting stuff out. Now, uh, and I'll probably go into that a bit more, but I think there's the, the obvious criticism there is, ah, so does that make this a game about greed? Or does it encourage, uh, this I've heard this, murder hoboism? Does it encourage a very negative attitude to the world? You're just here to destroy stuff and get stuff. Or whatever, or whatever. Um, and here's the thing that, it, it uh, basically, it doesn't. No, it, in both theory, when you actually look at what you'd expect the incentives to be, and in practice, at my table and many other tables, uh, this isn't the case. Uh, he, uh, and it's relevant to think in terms of what um, I've got these, yeah, the two EDMG here. Uh, I played uh, a hybridised two uh, E as my AD and D uh, for a few reasons. Uh, I played plenty of one E before as well, uh, but it is something. It's undeniable that there is a declension in two E to do with understandings of XP, um, and one thing you find is that um, what. In the XP section, what happens is you get told, okay, story XP exists and this is important. Uh, individual XP is a, is a strongly framed, really pushed, optional, technically optional, um, which replaces Gary's uh, kind of rewards and punishments based on role playing at the class's abilities. Um, and there is combat XP, which is bigger in second edition, like for certain monsters particularly, but you know, it goes up on average. And there is the, uh, um, uh, an optional rule for gold for XP with very little coverage, where, with a warning against giving players too much gold. And so to understand what, uh, you know, what the criticism from, from the 80s has been then, is that gold for XP uh, seemed to end up with characters having too much money. That's the only criticism given, and other things are put in place, so it doesn't become a game about Monty Hall games. There's an interesting similar thing where 
Zeb Cook pushes to return to 3d6 uh, in order, rather than 4d6, keep the highest three. This is for attribute creation, which Gary has has ended up going to for first edition. And he says it so characters aren't too super heroic. He says if you're into a tougher game, uh, with games characters being tougher, go for the 1e um, preference. There's obviously a worry that you've got characters who are too tough, with too much gold, that they don't know what to do with, um, and that this isn't a challenging enough game. And it's it's bizarre, of course, because second edition does not end up being, generally speaking, um, the producer of lots and lots of challenging, gritty, uh, hardcore, old school style adventures. That has some, but it's it's generally goes a very different route. And this is because of the XP systems. Story XP means that the dungeon master says you have to go and do this and then you get the XP. Combat XP is rewarded for killing, capture, routing, generally speaking. Some DMs would say, oh, well, if you negotiate, that's the same. And some adventures will actually give, really interestingly, that as an alternative form of combat XP. Uh, but combat XP assumes fighting. And so the two main forms of XP, uh, crafting uh, magic items actually is the only way that magic items you can get XP for. Gold for XP does not mention magic items under it, uh, incorrectly, basically. Um, but yes, you, with the basic, either core or recommended optional in this, you have a game which is going to be determined by the story the DM offers and the uh, monsters that you fight. And then if you add individual XP, it, which is good, to, I actually like there, there can be critiques of it but uh, i think it's actually good the idea is that you've got a uh, your pl your your character is getting xp by practicing in dangerous situations the things that makes their class their class but gold for xp does think different doesn't it you can immediately tell it's not going to be based on the dm's story options and it's not going to be based on having to kill things you don't have to either follow a story or kill things so what you need to do is go to places that are dangerous, encompass the threat, so escape the threat with the treasure. So it measures skill agnostic to violence and skill agnostic to story fulfillment. It's about locations. Gold for XP is a location-based game. And the biggest effect of this, I find, is, at least if you're doing this, this properly, is uh, that this massively expands player choice. It rewards their skill in a way that gives them choices. So Gold for XP, I think, is an incredibly clever mechanic in that sense. It, it has to be, if you wanted a single mechanic, that might be the cleverest mechanic in the first couple of versions of D&D. I'd say it's Gold for XP because, uh, like many Gygaxian mechanics, it he has a habit of doing things where one thing does two things. Um, a, an example, uh, a a probabilistic example is surprise. For instance, you roll surprise, you're surprised on a 1 to 2 on a d6, and uh, that can increase uh, based on class and so on, or decrease. And the, what, the number you roll uh, is the number of segments by which you are surprised, the number of surprise segments granted to the opponent. And the two are compared to each other if both sides are surprised. Um, and though uh, you could say, oh, but so surely you want to roll one rather than two, isn't one lower and therefore worse, and it's a roll high to escape surprise. Th this is a, a, a frivolous complaint, uh, obviously, but the point is that it's a clever mechanic that does two things, and gold for XP is a, a clever mechanic that does several things all at once. Um, it creates an XP mechanic. Yeah, great, we needed that anyway for advancement so you could become tougher. You're, so instead of your army leveling up in a campaign, we've won a victory, we can add a unit, your character levels up and get stuff in terms of wargaming. They become tougher, they become better at fighting. But also, it uh, it means that you, um, you've set an incentive. The incentive is to go somewhere and do something, and for the players to want to go and do that, and they have to be like, oh, we need to go there to get XP. It becomes proactive, rather than, ah, the bad guys have attacked, I guess we'll fight them and then we'll get XP, story XP, combat XP. They have to go somewhere and get something, uh, to get at least significant amounts of XP. There is, of course, combat XP in, in first edition too, uh, which you can see on this side. So you have uh, a, an, a, an incentive to be proactive. You have an incentive to explore locations rather than um, to follow storylines, and what this means is that the agency is in the player's hands. Uh, a uh, the DM is still creating the world, but it means the DM is creating a world, not a story, because there needs to be a world with locations the players can go to. Now, the DM 
can and I think should be setting up many locations. Uh, there's a exception to talking about how we talk about mega dungeons, but you know, there's several locations, there's different options. Go here, pursue this, this is a job you've been offered, this is a rumor that's come up. Um, and so the players are suddenly having to decide and judge what is a worthwhile prospect for exploration and uh, looting in the world. You know, that place sounds lucrative but dangerous. This place is less lucrative, but it's closer and uh, we've got an NPC who wants to come and help us do it because he wants to explore it. We'll do that instead. It creates player choice about what, not just what kind of in a very narrow situation do we try to do A or B, but it gives them 26 letters of the alphabet. They can do everything. There are all these options. So it incentivizes one, proactivity, players have to go and do stuff, but two, it incentivizes players to, um, uh, to decide amongst options and to, th and to measure risk. Uh, because that's the thing is that because it's about going down into the dungeon and getting stuff out of the dungeon, um, it's about the management of risk, which is at the core of old school D&D and is not at the core of highly story based D&D. Because the risk there, you have to go and take the risks because that's how you advance the plot. Whereas here, there is no plot. The plot is the story the characters choose to tell by their actions. Uh, there's more player choice stuff, which I'll get to in a moment, but let's answer an objection. Um, then what happens if it does this not just make players very greedy and ruthless? Well, it may do, but in my experience, uh, different players do different things. Different characters do different things. Um, because there is treasure in the dungeon that you designed, and because it's a generally accepted social rule that stuff in random ruins is up for grabs, uh, there's also other ways of adding in some of these options for XP, of course. Um, but we're talking about the classic example of going down to the dungeon and getting it out. Because of that, it doesn't encourage uh, particularly nihilistic behavior. Uh, it discourages unnecessary violence because why would you kill something from which you get some XP uh, if it's too dangerous? Why not avoid it? Why not befriend it and get information from it? Um, it, 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 it? It means in fact you become less nihilistic because there are other ways around the situation to get to one of the points of D&D, one of the things that makes a sustainable campaign game, which is its robust leveling system. So, in my experience, does it make players more ruthless, more cold? No, generally speaking, though they understand they need to get treasure as a measure of their uh, ability, um, and they have to weigh the risks to do it, they have to work out how to transport it if it's awkward or heavy uh, or breakable. It doesn't really encourage a sort of callousness, because they're in a location, and they're in a location generally for a reason, they've heard something about it, they want to find out more about, someone's offering to pay them. It does, I suppose, you, it, it's fair to say that the games it will produce are not uh, games that closely resemble the Company of the Ring going on its way in Lord of the Rings. Um, because, uh, in the sense that it, it can do, because wilderness adventures do go to different places. Uh, it's something where the incentive there uh, is, the incentives are highly background based. Aragorn eventually ends up wanting to go to Gondor for you know, reasons. Um, Frodo goes to the Mount Doom because he's got the quest to save the world, things like that. So yes, of course, uh, it's it has a very different structure. It's much more story uh, based in terms of why the characters do stuff. Um, whereas here, yes, you're not going to tell that kind of story automatically or quickly. However, here's what I find. Players become invested in a world you've created with all these locations they've explored and all these people they've met and all these uh, monsters they fought or befriended and factions they've aided or opposed. Uh, it's been dynamic and emergent and that means the players start to care about things and invest in the world. The fact that you have taken away story as a reason for players to do something in the world means the players start to care about the story of the world and they start to create it um, and uh, this will this leads neatly into um, the my other point about flexibility I wanted to talk about, um, which I actually need to find the right page reference in the 1E DMG. We'll look at some, after I talk a bit more about why this creates choice and flexibility and therefore what it does for the game um, is I will talk about uh, some adventures and give, look at some examples of how this happens in games. So, is this... Uh, 
construction and siege construction constructions yes so this is the one e uh, this is an example there's several things sections like this in in uh, the, the same section roughly as the dmg um, but here's the other thing that that having gold does it creates choice and it creates incentive at the level of being xp <clears throat> but it becoming a major part of your game i because players go into the the dungeon to get it um making you need to find ways to spend it this is one thing that gary does mention it. it's obviously what zeb cook is worried about when he says oh players could end up with too much uh, what that belies is a game because my get my players generally don't have very much uh spare cash what it belies is that players um uh, is that these are games sorry that people are playing where lots of the suite of activities in early D, &D uh, simply did not happen basically uh, and here's some examples of what I mean. Training. Training is an optional rule in 2nd edition. Uh, with a uh, surprisingly swinging, I think more more expensive possibly. I, I don't remember, but I think more expensive than in 1st edition. And the 1st edition training is one of the few places where you could query the scaling of the cost, I think, anyway. But the point is that training is a way where you have to spend loads of gold uh, to get better at stuff. Because you have to go and pay for a practice with someone. You have to go and pay for ingredients. You have to... Uh, you know, but maybe maybe uh, have your your weapon and armor and everything else sorted and repaired as you know, or as an abstracted part of this process. Uh, you might need to talk to a sage and find out information about the El ancient green dragon that's uh, plaguing the region, and he knows about it. You go to a city and you have to travel there for and pay. You have to pay for bed and board. You go to the sage, you pay a lot of money. Uh, you don't yet have a high enough level enchanter, or you do. Either way, you have to pay for the magic items you want to have created. Uh, all these things are expensive and here construction and siege the idea of that you're going to end up with a stronghold and here's a, a list of all the cost of um, <coughs> stronghold construction uh, plus war machines and how they affect strongholds siege attack values and so on and so forth um, yeah this idea that uh, you're you're going to end up at ninth, ninth level name level being the the time where you start getting followers and maybe reasonably expected to start building a stronghold um, once you get to ninth level which is happening in about I think about a year of Gary's campaign uh, is ninth level uh, that's playing much regular more regularly and for longer sessions than most games nowadays uh, but yeah you get to ninth level after a year and you have a stronghold and you have retainers and you've got to pay them and you've got to pay for the stronghold and you've got to pay for the continued ex you know maintenance of the thing uh, of course you may well have a barony so you you could be gathering taxes so there is a continued money game there that's that becomes part of why being a mid-level character who's a high mid-level sorry who's often semi-retired because of all their duties is interesting because rather than you adventuring every every week it may well be that you go out for an adventure once a year on a particularly tough thing you know this is especially true when you're 15th or 16th level this is part of why tomb of horrors existed why he wrote s1 tomb of horrors i was to challenge those high level semi-retired characters but the rest of the time your your model is off the board you have your other characters to do stuff with but instead you're do, make, doing the other wargamey things and gold which is a key part of the cycle of the game feeds into this um, continued mid to high level emergent play which then of course feeds back into all the other emergent structures where rather than it being a story the dm tells um, instead it's a, a a world that is created by the dm and the players shape so gold for xp is part of what and leads and leads to that so gold for xp is this incredibly clever mechanic that does not make greedier, more violent players. Um, it may well tend, you know, I, I, I don't think it's deniable. It tends to emphasize um, the Fafnir and the Grey Mauser over Frodo going to Mount Doom. Uh, but of course, Fafnir and the Grey Mauser do often end up doing quite heroic things. They sometimes decide that a thing just needs to get done and they're the only people who can do it. Conan is the same uh, once or twice. And that's because those are characters invested in the worlds they're in just like players become invested in worlds where um, exploration and engagement and curiosity and decision making and risk management um, and um, options to do things and, and and build your own kind of lifestyle and, and world 
uh, where those matter, players become invested in the world and therefore start going around protecting it. You know, uh, what, what is it? Uh, Jane says in Serenity, if you can't do something smart, do something right. So that's uh, a the the main I guess let's call that the theory section of this. Why that gold for XP on the basis of the earliest editions of D and D is um, a great way to encourage player choice and agency and exciting emergent games where you the dm if you are the dm in this case get to enjoy seeing what players do and what they decide rather than running them through the gauntlet of your story but let's look at some examples that i'll look at examples both of i call it poor and good uses of this i'm going to look at four adventures um a couple of which are quite short i know we look at them in all in loads of detail uh, but which all of which i like they're all good I should say they're all good but two of them don't really support gold for xp play as they are and two do a really interesting thing uh, is that you see well into second edition at a point where you're looking at fairly linear scene based um adventures or you're looking at adventures which have some locations but they're not very big uh but in these that you still get stuff where you're like oh in this eight room dungeon which is the only real location in the adventure uh, there's still several rooms with treasure, including a bunch of magic treasure, which, if you were porting to first edition Gold for XP rules, would still count. And you think, oh wow, this is there's a decent amount of treasure here. Not necessarily enough in terms of XP budgets, but there's a lot of treasure here. And there's a thing you realise reading these, um, in the same way you get it even up to fifth edition, is some of this is a genuine desire from designers to be like, look, players still need stuff so they can hire hirelings buy armor whatever even though it no longer is is default xp it's also a cargo cult thing where you've got designers who are putting stuff in they don't really understand why it's there anymore the magic item is different here but the, the kind of random small amounts of gold you find places which is a, a leftover a leave over from homlet t1 village of homlet particularly is something where I don't think the designer in 93 understands why that happens in 78 or whatever it was. But there we are. Uh, let's look at first the one page dungeon which I've used, uh, Burial Mound of Gilead Wolf Clan. Uh, this is, as you can see, a nine room, um, a nine room starter dungeon. Um, I, uh, let's do a micro review because I'm not going to do a video on this. It has an above ground area that just has monsters in it, um, which is a shame. You go down uh, the well and you end up inside the barrow. There's um, an empty room with a secret door behind some rubbish that helps you avoid a trap. In the next room um, is empty. You can take normal doors. There's goblins uh, who uh, can be allied with. Then on the other side, there's a drow and a goblin witch doctor and uh, they are the bad guys and they have a small amount of their own treasure downwards there are some centipede giant centipedes uh, there is a wolf totem um, shrine there's a room with some dead goblins and a trapped door and then there is a uh, a ghoul and some skeleton followers and the ghoul has a magic sword it has uh, it, 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 we would not say this was a big looper. Uh, you do literally have a, a micro loop there, but that is, of course, not a real one. That's basically about the choice between this and this. It does teach a bunch of interesting early skills, like with the. Um, it, ha it has a couple of traps in it. It has some negotiation possible in a couple of places. Uh, my players negotiated to, uh, with the, the the elf to fight the ghoul, uh, but then double crossed the elf and and uh, killed them. It's a good little adventure to start with. This was a group with uh, with kids, as well as my wife. Um, but he, there's virtually no treasure, as you'll note. Uh, the goblins, the goblin boss has no treasure. Uh, the upper upper level bad guys have uh, 65 gold in treasure. <coughs> and here, uh, the ghoul one, the ghoul guy just has uh, a silver dagger, 100 gold pieces, and um, a two-handed sword, which is worth, is that worth 800 or 1200? I'm trying to remember. Uh, in terms of, as treasure XP, not as gold, it's worth more as straight gold. 
but yeah you know so there's one big item which i guess if you immediately exchanged it out uh would level up a group of course it'd also be their first magic weapon i'm tempting to keep i guess that there's a player choice there but you know whatever it doesn't have much though you're talking about most of this place is just killing stuff you could ally with goblin boss hogor but you, you you're going to generally speaking have to kill skarzik blake gilead and the uh, skeletons um, and possibly a direwolf oh and the giant centipedes so you're getting combat xp from that uh, annoyingly a uh, very good adventure as i say but um a genuine mistake is not putting presumed xp this is pretty obviously something like for basic because of the um hp and as in because of the um the, the things they can have and the level these these monsters are at but it's also not you know it's it's also just generic dnd &D. uh but yeah you're fighting the fire beetles as well as we go into the one side location uh which is as i say a mistake there's no treasure there but it's plain that the designer doesn't think this needs treasure there's no treasure in the shrine um there's no treasure in it there's no kind of uh searching in the shelf of broken clay jars and so on uh could turn will turn up a a, a single a uh, gold piece with an unusual woven head on it, for instance. Uh, the goblin boss has no treasure. There's no personal treasure on <coughs> the elf and witch doctor. There is a small amount of cash that the elf has, but there's no kind of necklace or anything. There's no what's the portable treasure like a necklace. Um, in all these rooms, these three rooms, there is no treasure. In here, there is treasure: a uh, hundred gold and a silver dagger. <clears throat> and a genuinely XP-wise, potentially very valuable sword if you're playing AD&D. &D. In basic, I don't think magic items uh, render XP, do they? Someone correct me in the comments. But yeah, if we run it in AD&D, &D, it becomes valuable. This, uh, this designer wants to teach negotiation and trap discovery and fighting monsters and interaction with oddities that's that's a wonder essentially <clears throat> but gold for xp is not on the menu and the assumption of why you go there is that old Tuli tells you something and that maybe you can get a magic sword from it you know that you're not told here are the options this is one of them or it's not even a cash reward up front actually it's a kind of there's treasure there which to be fair is is on point on the other hand let's look at um yeah we'll look at another week one a good adventure again i recently reviewed this as part of the planescape product world of worlds by colin mccomb it's low level <coughs> it is a going into a demi plane prisony thing and working to get a magic sword called lightbringer off vartus timlin this imprisoned uh X factor and there's loads of great stuff about this hey there's timelines there's specialized factional encounters and factional behaviors for the other factions who go in there is a dungeon map which is actually a moderately interesting dungeon map with virtually no key this is a, a weakness of it in terms of treasure though let's go room one um no no treasure room two a self-healing statue that is not treasure room three Timlin has his sword, I like to bring her. Uh, he also has some other random weapons. Which, yeah. Uh, room four, storeroom, there's nothing there. Uh, room five, the way out, again, no treasure. McComb puts, apart from the sword, no treasure in this. So, in, in fact, even in terms of, ah, it's not XP anymore, but players do use it to buy stuff, they do use it to pay sages. Not at all present here. It's a good adventure. Like I still defend that point, despite the fact the in, the incentive cycle is broken. Uh, there's the the sh shape of it is good. You can fill in in both this case and the um, and in the Gilead Wolf Clan one. You can always fill in some of this quite easily. Gilead Wolf Clan is very easy to do. This one you need to because the dungeon is complete already, and you can just add treasure. This one is uh, a little harder, I think, because you'd actually have to put. You'd have to design the uh <coughs> you'd have to design in the uh, the dungeon to make it work 
but the idea that here you're just here to do the story and there'll be a reward presumably elsewhere but it's you you're not even normally financially benefiting from doing this let alone that it's it could even be presumed you could go there because it's a worthwhile location to explore to just become better at stuff these are, and this is obviously later this is 94 or so burial mound is modern uh, but they both show an attitude that players go to locations because they're told to by NPCs or by the DM. Uh, they don't make decisions about what they're going to do. And and that's actually not an uncommon thing in Planescape Adventures is that though you can technically turn down the job, essentially you just shouldn't turn down any job anyone ever offers you because otherwise they'll never speak to you again. There's no uh, proactivity and no agency for the players in these. You are, the DM is there to tell you what's happening this week. And here, yeah, um, <clears throat> that's fine. You can adapt and, and, and do a lot with these adventures. Uh, but they need different incentives. Let's look at uh, Gel Wine Fall by Anthony Husso. I haven't reviewed this on the channel, I think. This is a very good level, uh, second to third level adventure by him. Where the PCs have to go on the astral plane to a lich's lair because they are the only, only low level people can even go there. Uh, Shadrod Dakod has protected his his hourglass floating in the astral plane so well that high level characters can't go there to steal stuff and so you have to go there and do something um, and you can get players involved a few ways I made it a guild service for the Nightwolf Inn also by Anthony Husso um, but yeah it's a puzzle dungeon it's a good one I have talked about it in a previous aspects now the first room you come into, VC2, has a monster and it has a trap and it has <coughs> these two doorways. Now basically here, this is, is worth saying that there's no treasure um, apart from in the middle here where it's been crushed by the trap. So it's a, it's a clue for the trap. A potion of healing, leather armour. Um, plus two astral relevant in this case and a wand of magic missiles with 15 charges and a command word now there's not much treasure but that is all magic magic item those are all magic items which are going to count for xp either as cash out xp or more likely especially because you're getting them at the start of the game it might well be your second session it might well be the first if you're starting at second level you're going to get this you're going to get the treasure xp rather than the gold xp for it but there, yeah, you immediately get some items. That, but other than that, there's not much there. Now, the whole point is you can go to different rooms. This is what I talked about with the the there's the core play dynamic video I did. It's when you uh, knock once, you go to VC1. Knock twice, you go to VC2. Um, knock three, and you go to VC3. Um, so, yeah, here, these are... Well, that's it. Some silly, silly, intentionally silly layout choices. VC1. <coughs> you check if you're a random encounter there, and then um, you have to, because uh, the sand is being sucked into the middle in this one, is it? Um, yeah, transition to blue at the centre, and they collapse into a horrifying central funnel. Now, here you've got different locations around there, the North Cardinal position, the A's and the M's, so um, matching monsters and so on. Um, but the North Cardinal position, there is a silver ledge and there's a skeleton with stuff, including a, a spell book, um, some, yeah, four potions and a silver dagger, which is a plus one silver dagger. In fact, it's a plus two, so you get the XP for that. Now you're going and you're, uh, it's interesting, he doesn't actually, in most of these rooms, actually put a ton of straight up gold treasure. Uh, he's actually keeping it fairly simple and based on the, the idea that characters who come here previously have left their gear, their main adventuring gear. So again, you go into the next room and you find your way over to the right place where you need to, uh, to go. Uh, they're ranged at positions A here on a silver ledge. So if they, ex they explore, they find stuff, they're going to get XP once it is out of the dungeon. Uh, there is a complication actually, which I must ask Tony about, but about the way in which 
uh, the level up magic that happens to do with this, um, which is to do with how uh, Dacod it prevents people coming back, uh, how that works. But yeah, anyway, uh, VC3, which you can also go to from the start, is where you arrive, you find an alien rib cage with a uh, Dreamlands footman's flail, and that's it. There's no other treasure here, but there, there, there's combat XP, and he does put the XP there, uh, including, yeah, this is quite a good layout, but yeah, Astral Mego is being worth uh, XP 217. Uh, but at this point, much more of the XP has come, because this is first edition, from the treasure you're picking up. As I say, there may be an exception with the rules, but the idea that the, the way the rooms are investigated is you are, it's also, it, this is a training module, and I think you see that with the way various rooms are designed. So the fact you're picking these items up and you're deciding how to put them amongst your party um, and you know also the fact you because you know they're worth XP um, you would ordinarily at least be trying to then bring them out of the dungeon. So a player may choose not to use one of course if they know how one E works. The other is this is um, Rule Cyclopedia era Dungeons and Dragons? In fact, it's a uh, late black box 1990s. Jade hair. Uh, what year is it from? 92. So 46 first level characters. This is for basic, basic, and that is to say. So a mad warlock has stolen this thing from the village. There's wandering monsters. You can show, tell the era. If you'd like to liven up their, their uh, life, you may throw wandering monsters at them. And it does, as explained in the D&D game rules, 1d6, one, one no one means a wandering monster. <coughs> Some of these, I would say, like 1d4, uh, 2hd specials, giant crab spiders could be pretty painful uh, with a delay, say, versus poison or death. Uh, say, 1d3 ghouls at first level. Dear me. That is not that's not exactly unfair though you get plenty of actual other you know classic first level modules with so many ridiculous things yeah so you you do get one of these th this is the sort of thing that I actually is usually a good sign uh, I'll actually get the map up first here we go the, hey two entrances I've I've pretty much definitely drawn maps like this this is a early example of how you think about uh, a simple early example of how you think about multiple entrances and routes um, yeah you can see there are uh, four entrances into the main complex uh, which some of which are keyed directly so yeah the back cave um, there's a five percent chance per turn searching you find like a small piece of amber but only one only one thereof fit worth 50 GP that's not worth doing, but it is a good example of gold treasure <coughs> as a um, as a oh, oh, right, that because Abu Kabal wants it, maybe it is worth finding. But it is a reminder that you're choosing how to spend your time. Rem remember, that given that we have these wandering monsters thing, at the end of every other turn, you're rolling a d6. So there is a cost to your activity here, especially given the individual chance at 5% is pretty poor. Now it could be that, um, you know, if you're a bunch of you are searching, then really you're, you've you got enough of a chance that you're gonna get through it in a couple of turns, but there we are. Storage room, nothing worth um, worth XP. Kitchen, pretty mediocre, minor stuff in the hobgoblin and goblins pouches. Nothing in the dining room. Goblin barracks, uh, mostly pretty indifferent, 3D4 CP, very indifferent treasure, but there is one which has a potion of invisibility and another which has um, a porcelain statuette of a camel worth 80 GP. Both are destroyed if the footlockers are broken open. Uh, so again, that's a, uh, this, this, that's a very, very pure, um, very original, in terms of, by original I don't mean new, I mean in the sense of traditional way of presenting treasure. There's a statuette, it's light, it's worth a lot, it's it's a lot light, it's not going to be weigh 8 pounds, which 80 GP does, i.e. 80 uh, gold piece weight. So it's going to be lighter than that. Now one thing is, you can tell, somewhat tell the error that there's no concern whatsoever about GP weight. You, you know, it's not even like a, 
Well, a ring weighs one GP weight. What does a statuette weigh? I don't know. Um, that's not even always dealt with in, in much earlier modules. Potion of Invisibility as well. So that, that is probably more valuable as an item you keep, though in AD and you'd get treasure XP for, for even if you were keeping it. Uh, but again, you need to be careful about how you loot stuff because, and this is a proof of skill, is that treasure that can be broken, it, getting it successfully out proves your skill. So you can be more generous with that with stuff that can be broken in the same way you can be more generous with stuff that is hidden uh, you don't want to give okay I want this to be enough to level up five first level fighters so I need to put 10,000 XP between combat and treasure no you want to give like 20,000 XP if you really want it to be that that will reliably level them up you want you know a lot more XP because they're not going to fight everything in fact do you even want them to fight everything is that the job is that the game and they're also not going to find everything, particularly if you've hidden some stuff. Now, you could say, well, what I will do is I'll have a super over-generous treasure allotment in one place, but with a complex puzzle, it's, it's hidden with a clue, and there's a, pu a complex puzzle to get in. But it's worth on its own 10,000 GP. That's not a crazy or unreasonable thing, uh, necessarily, and we see that in first-level dungeons, including somewhat this one. Uh, <laughs> the trap actually saying there's not a box description here because they'll give your players uh, a clue that there's a trap the small chamber has a dead goblin with a medallion worth 150 now um, the molds are the mold covers well the molds are covering stuff including the dead body of a goblin um, so here you've got treasure gated by monster um, and you wouldn't it Typically, you might actually see that one as uh, being um, it's destroyed if you destroy the mold uh, without in a kind of non-careful way. Um, I, I've seen ones like that, but I think it, that that's maybe particularly harsh. Like treasure, trapped treasure, or like friable treasure like that, where you're like, well, how am I ever going to get by brushing off the mold? In this case, you kill the mold, you get a medallion. That's fine. Um, there is a lieutenant to Abu Gabar, the bugbear Balgoruk, and he has a battle axe plus one, plus 155 GP, and no other valuables apparently. Uh, the big thing there is that the battle axe plus one uh, is, again, here it's not as valuable as a magic item, and so it's treasure for the sake of treasure, but in AD&D the equivalent would be worth treasure XP at least. There's a lab, experimental potions, there's an argument these would be worth XP if taken out of the dungeon um, at a 25 or 50% or whatever of the uh, the potion it's trying to be. But there we go. Um, that uh, As in, that's that's a matter for, for uh, your consideration. I do, I have I have put elements like these in dungeons before, like as in a p potion of minor healing, that sort of thing. <coughs> and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll assign gold for, um, XP values. These don't have XP values because it's not in, in that version of, of basic. And then we have Abu Gabar's chamber and a Tennessee portal and the treasure room. And this is one, this is like the famous uh, T1 village of Homla. I've already mentioned that actually, where an enormous amount of the treasure is gated in what well, a couple of rooms downstairs in the dungeon, but particularly uh, in more or less the final room, the boss room with Larith. Uh, and um, that there's there's that's an intentional choice by the guy who invents the game who invents this principle it's a harsh choice there are other Gary modules amongst other things where it's not like that uh, but it's something where it does happen the idea that a lot of the challenge ends up being about getting to the final room so you prove it, it becomes much more an extended test of will and ability rather than a um, punctuated diving in and out and uh, you know that 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 could be perceived as harsh by players, uh, but I don't think it generally will be. It shows there are different ways to do it. You don't have to be like, it is not that. And we see this from what I think is a reasonably designed basic module for this purpose. We do not see that every room has treasure. We do not see that every room has equal treasure. Um, it, without it being an amazing uh, module, it's just a solid one, but where there's a variety of rooms, including basically empty rooms, including rooms where there's risk reward on yellow mold, 
wasting time searching for bat guano, but there might be something in it that um, could be uh, potentially useful, I guess. And yeah, uh, so he himself has a bunch of magical items. Again, technically as designed, not worth XP here. Uh, so he killing him is not getting you XP other than for him, which is only 175. Uh, these swinging rates on, on like some of these things, um, you know, you think he's definitely worth more than that, isn't he? But uh, yeah, you at least can get um, maybe the dagger plus one, the spell scroll and the potion. He may have well, he may have drunk the potion and he may have depleted his spell scroll uh, from being worth. Is that worth 400? Am I right in thinking that? Uh, in AD and D terms, not in basic terms. But yes, the treasure is cut by a gargoyle, um, of all things. It's a young specimen, thankfully. Um, but yes, then there's uh, 91 gold, 12 PP. That's that's kind of... Uh, and then, yeah, 50, uh, 25 gold in the sheet of silk. There's a point here that you can tell... This is There's mixed, there's mixed messages here. One thing is that Nephew, John Nephew, is putting a lot of treasure in um, of different kinds... Um, of different access mechanisms, different values, different ways of getting, um, different uses because you might some are consumables. Like there is, e though this is a T1 style one, Jawine Fall is um, is much more punctuated. Like there's just a bit of stuff in different places. It's quite valuable. The you know all the magic items that are all over the place. Uh, the artifacts you can take um, from the oracle, the slime oracle. Uh, for instance, you know, there's basically something in every room and it's incredibly generous set up a campaign, the start, and it, that's intentional, very intentional, set up a campaign kind of adventure. Um, and yeah, you know, there's a uh, search through, whilst you're in these uh, various floating cubes, search through stuff to see if they Left stuff, including a uh, Hewitt's Handy have a sack and a rod of cancellation. You know, amazing stuff. Uh, this one does still have a big treasure room at the end. That is not atypical. Uh, there is tw there are twenty six things, including a quantum crown, Quill's feather token, black tunsia dagger with silver chain grip, uh, increasing a th which increases backstab, twelve exquisite silver arrows of slaying, four wondrous weapons, soul resonance weapons, um, two potions of rapturous visions. You know, there, there's loads of stuff there, but everywhere else has stuff. Where uh, and that that is that's the m more punctuated type. The T1 type is more like the jade hair, um, and it's is heavily loaded in at the end. You could say though, I should say that looking at the jade hair, um, the fact that uh, yes, it is not always clear. You know, it's something where if you are not counting magic items for XP. The XP value goes down drastically. Um, so, as dungeon design and as uh, using treasure as an incentive and as a feature of rooms and as a as a feature of adventure design, the Jade Hair is very good. Um, T1, which is an AD and D module, which I do have next to me. I have T1 to four. In fact, more controversially, um, there we go. But here. Uh, in the moat house, which is 20 something, 27 rooms, is or is it slightly more than that? 30, 35 rooms. <sighs> Getting to the penultimate room before the boss does get you. There's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I should say that there's pl there's plenty in that room. Basically, it's in those two rooms. You've got 2,900 in gems, 1,000 in a chain of office, and 500 in a topaz. Whereas the guard room, a room ahead of that, People are carrying maybe a few PP, and the sergeant has a few extra plus a 50 GP gold necklace. There's very little in there. Then you go to the lieutenant. There's a lot of stuff, and then Larith himself has a staff of striking and a gold. Yeah, um, fifteen thousand in his uh, gold chain uh, between the jewels and stuff. A black opal worth a thousand GP, a phylactery of action, and uh, four thousand gold in silver goblets, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff in those two rooms, um, and that is including the magic items. Does all count for XP? So in terms of a classic exemplar of that, uh, 
possibly actually slightly more harshly designed than the Jade Hair, T1 is, is the way to go. So you can see that, uh, just to draw from these practical examples uh, and, and bring us into land, you can see that gold functions as a um, incentive to go places to get the XP. Um, gold including treasure there if you're playing AD&D. &D. Um, it functions as something that lets you do stuff in the world. And when we actually look at how adventures work, it sets up the things the players are expecting to do and find. And it's tough because, of course, an adventure, in, if you play gold for XP, but you're in a game and you have an adventure that doesn't have it, then your players may start acting weirdly. They might be confused. You, uh, and they're certainly going to be potentially less incentivized because they'll realize there's not one of the key things that gets you going into the dungeon. But what we do see in the, in the so Gilead Wolf Clan, in that sense, is weaker. So is uh, Well of Worlds Mazes. Uh, players who are looking for the fungibility of money at the end of the day um, and the power the power upgrade of getting more XP may be more cautious about those jobs. Um, what well, at least if they know what the situation is like, or they may be disappointed after they do them and find they've earned virtually no XP. My players didn't care, but I did note that with Gilead Wolf Clan that I was like, ah, actually, even with um you know, it, it, even with all the XP from that, it's very little really, isn't it? They haven't actually earned very much. The Jade Hair, um, uh, on the other hand, sets up a challenge of different access points, different challenges to get stuff, including the most valuable stuff early on, is actually fragile. And then a lot of it is gated with the boss fight and treasure room. The same with uh, T1, with the Moat House. Joa and Fall takes the alternative approach, which is you're regularly uh, rewarding players exploring, and in this case, there are particular purposes in the exact uh, in the in the module design. Um, but uh, the player is coming out of it with a lot of stuff, uh, particularly in this case, magic items actually, and um, and tools. So it also functions not just as an incentive and as a tool for the players in their later careers, but also as a um, a function of adventure design to lead players to interact with the environments in particular ways and to explore the environment itself, not just go to the environment to explore the environment itself, you know, to get to the end game, to look into the secret doors and find stuff like I mentioned with the fact you can gate super valuable stuff behind a tough um, puzzle. Uh, that's that's some thoughts on why gold for XP is useful. Some discussion about how I can see it working in some practical examples, and uh, I, I can find many others that be equally interesting. I'd love to know your thoughts on gold for XP. Tell me in the comments. Tell me, I guess, generally your thoughts about how you award XP in your D and D games, and and argue justify why. Um, I will see you next time.